Hey everyone, it is TechSags Rewind presented by T-Mobile. They want you to visit T-Mobile.com so you can get more value and coverage through T-Mobile. Brandon Leone in the house. Hey, bud. Come on. Hitting the gym, bro. <laughs> no, I'm trying to be like you, man. Well, whatever. Hey, That's it. we had a fun show. Uh, Billy called in early. Samu, the, the latest to join the fold here, a commit for Texas A&M. We had to break that down. We did 22 and 22. Number 19 was Walter Nolan. That dude's going to be a beast, man. He's going to be a beast and a disruptor. 100%. Yeah, and he's a guy who I, OB and I talked about. He doesn't have to perform. I mean, he, we want him to f- perform right away, but he doesn't have to. He's in a position of strength with so many other guys around him, yet if he's ready to roll, let him roll. Yeah, let him roll, and then the other beauty of that is he can come in fresh. Yeah. And so every time he comes in, they're going to be getting the best version of Walter Nolan because there's depth around him. So he can create a lot of mismatches this year as a freshman. So we talked about that. We also talked a little Michigan football. We talked a little Vandy football, get you ready for the season. And this guy was in studio, had some great insight as uh, the, uh, the today's the day. They report, and practice begins tomorrow. It's Tech Sacks Rewind. And number 19, my friend, is Walter Nolan. Again, one of those cases that I wouldn't be surprised in three or four months. He's way higher on the list. Um, but this is not only a projection of where he is, we think, today, uh, but also <laughs> with such a crowded defense – it may take time for him to work his way in, but I would not be surprised like Evan Stewart if he's a day one or day two. Um, yeah, obviously um, a lot of ability there. Uh, a lot of potential, but a lot of ability. And how quickly is he going to be able to make the transition to being a uh, you know great high school player, phenomenal high school player, to being a good and that's what you should look for first, just being able to be a, a, a solid contributor. Yep. And then later you become great. Now, that said, I brought this up earlier. Uh, according to one of the, the, the recruiting services, his rating number, percentage number, however you, whatever you call it, was 09997. Okay. Miles Garrett was 099. Nine three. So Walter Nolan, according to this uh, recruiting service, is the highest rated uh, A and M recruit ever. It's pretty good. Now, is it fair to expect him to come in and do what Miles Garrett did? No, no, it's not fair. But and what he doesn't he have to. Well, that's true. Miles Garrett came in and uh, he immediately became the best pass rusher on campus. The, the year before, uh, A&M had one of the most anemic pass rushes in college football. I think Gavin Stansbury in 2013 was the leading leader with sacks with three. And Miles came in, and he was second in the SEC as a freshman with 11 and a half sacks. Ridiculous. Now, is Walt, are we going to expect Walter Nolan to do that? No. Does he have to? Well, if Fidel Diggs and Tumisi Adili and some of the other guys that we've heard about are as good as, as we've heard, well, then no, you know, you don't have to. Miles had to be good for A and M to, to be significant. Right. Uh, I only can imagine what the record would have been that year had Miles decided to go somewhere else. Yeah. It, um, so we have not got a chance to watch Walter up close. Right. He was not an early enrollee, so our first chance is going to be tomorrow to to see him up close. Both from what I've seen on film and what I've just seen him walking around, this is this is a big, strong, fast dude. And, and my question is: Is he an interior guy or is he an end? I think of him as an interior guy, um, but when you have that kind of athletic ability, line him up anywhere. His high school weight is uh, 325. I mean, yeah. That screams uh, interior. But if he moves and is explosive. As they say, and and A and M is good in the interior. Do you do you try him on the you know on the edge and see if he can't you know be a I don't know be that that big strong pass rusher that you're not sure if you have or not. Going back to what Billy was talking about with Samu, I, I think that's the beauty of this defense is you've got so many guys that you can actually experiment a little bit yeah. and try Walter out. You can try him in the middle, like you when you've got guys that you can trust all along put them in the best position to win. But you know, Jimbo also likes it, and he brought this up uh, in Atlanta because I asked him about the pass rush and uh, retooling that pass rush is going to be key for a and this year. And he, 
he said, yeah, we've got guys that are doing this and that. And he says, but, you know, pass rush doesn't have to come just from the ends. And he reiterates that a lot about the the inside pass rush. Get mm-hmm. it from the interior. That's, that, that counts too. And he sounds very – optimistic about that inside pass rush. Well, I don't blame him when you got a Shamar Turner and you got uh, McKinley Jackson. I don't blame him at all, but I, I wonder if that's kind of a, a hint that where Walter's going to be. And I don't know that. I'm just, again, I'm just speculating and wondering. Yeah. Billy, tell, talk to us about Samu. Why is this such a big deal? Oh, man. I, look, it, I, I talk, you and I were talking about it yesterday. I said, what do you get the person that has everything? You know, and that's a and D line right now. You want edge rushers? They got them. You want, you know, 300 pounders that can play strong side end? They got them. You want interior, you know, future first round draft pick? They got them. You want depth? They've got it. You want uh, a two deep full of five stars? They could do that too if they wanted to. You want experience? They got it. What they don't have out of all of that is a guy like Samu. They don't have a a 350-plus pound, and, and he really he played closer to 400 pounds last year. Uh, now came in this past weekend at 360. They don't have a body type like that. And, and then on top of that, what Bronny and I were saying, you know, he is a rare find for anybody. With that, that that can move like he can move and bend like he can bend with that kind of size and power. So he's a very uh, – Bronny described him as unique, and I agreed. But I said, you know what, though? I'd take it a step further and say you, it's a rare. It's rare that you find a guy like this. And, and it's going to be, I mean, perfect fit when, when they want to slide into, you know, a three-down front. Would put him right there at the nose. He'd be a real problem. Uh, you want to, and the guy can also easily play defensive tackle, you know, in an even front. So I think he's, you know, just something different and somebody that's really good. Remember, like in the last little stretch here, a lot of people thought he was going to Oregon because Oregon was all over him. So, you know, he had Oregon, he had, uh, Texas, USC, Miami, A&M came in, and that was clearly the one he'd been waiting on. You have that legacy of the Tascacita, and uh, he jumped on it. And I know just from talking to sources, people are really excited about him. Well, it sounds like Griffin is. Um, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I, he, to me, and I brought this up, and I know this is way – you know, putting the cart way before the horse, but isn't he kind of the same kind of – uh, Clay, you know, the thing to work with that Jordan Davis was when he went to Georgia. Wasn't he a big guy that was, that was, I mean, he was just a three star guy, but he was a big guy that can move. And you start with that and you see what you can get out of it. Yeah, no doubt. And in a perfect world, that's what, that's what he ends up being. I mean, maybe not a guy that some people are saying might be the best player in college football last year, or the most disruptive or dominant anyway. But I mean, if he can be, you know, reach uh, just a fraction of that. This is a guy that, man, I, used to, I was mentioning Olin Mount Cody. Remember him? Yeah, Terrence Cody, Alabama. Years ago. Mm-hmm. Just guys like that that you just you, you can't move. Vince Wilfork. I mean, maybe he ends up being, you know, we're talking about some of the best of the best, but why not? Because because of that uniqueness of size and stuff, and then they're at a certain weight, you know, and when a guy reaches 400 pounds, Schools kind of take a wait and see approach, and now at 360, everybody's going, "Well, damn, he still moves incredibly well at 360, even better now. Let's take him." And uh, so those guys typically aren't your five-star type of guys. They have to develop. They have to get to a college. You know, I don't know how much he has to necessarily keep his weight down. I know ideally, uh, you'd like him probably to be in that range he's at now. I mean, but guys play, he, you know, he already, he was playing at four, at 400. He was playing like, <laughs> but I mean, the fact that he got down to that, it's kind of like Jermaine said, he, he wasn't as, you know, Jermaine's taller, but they told him when he came to camp, lose some weight, you come back. If we see you in the fall and you're 30 pounds lighter, you have an offer. 
Maybe he can be. And that was from Jim Turner to a Fetty, and he did it. So I think his stock, some of his stock is like through the absolute roof right now. Uh, but Texas A&M was the one he wanted. I'm thinking maybe he can be like a, a guy here at A&M in a different sport and be kind of the football version of Tyler Davis, a guy that was way too heavy and worked his way into shape and became a you know an all-conference type of guy. Yeah, no question. And I, I just love the fact – I love the fact that this, this to me – is Elijah Robinson, DJ Durkin, and Jimbo Fisher now going? All right, you know what? What are, what are the finishing pieces for this O line masterpiece here that we've put together? Um, of course, Elko played a big role in that early, you know, right up until this year. But what, what is, what's the finishing touch here to put on this thing? And that doesn't mean that they're done. They're going to keep, you know. Hell, they'd love to add another five star in, in DJ Hicks because that he has the potential to be as good as anybody, you know. So you want to keep going, but when you're just looking at what don't we have, okay, we don't have this, and, and, and no pun intended here because I'm, I'm talking or I'm, the correlation makes sense, but it's like having a loaded, loaded backfield and going, man, it would be nice to have a throwback pure fullback in there. Or it would be nice to have a what we don't have is a two hundred and fifty pound hammer in short yardage and goal line. Let's go get that. You know, and, and that's where they're at now on the D line and I think that's what they they found. And this is the guy that could you know, he could play a lot because like I said, he's he's an inside guy in in any front you play. It's it's not like Hey, they just recruited a pure a pure nose guard. No, that that was close enough. And look, it, it was at face value, it's a silly statement. They're never going to be the best program in in the country. But I would say this in his defense: aim for the stars, and if you hit the moon, it's better than they've done. Expectations are not a thing Vanderbilt is used to or really encouraged. So, I guess if you want to look at it in another way, if from a Vanderbilt perspective. Again, I don't know that I would have said that. It, it does sound silly, but it, but at least there's aim for doing something other than being awful, which they've been for a while now. So talk to us a little bit about Clark, because I do believe that is our first real look at him. I know people remember last year at SEC Media Days, he he made a nice appearance. But like in the in the year that you've seen him do his thing, what, what has stood out? Really like him. Uh, he is one of the more sincere people I've ever been around. Um, I think that helps him in recruiting. He has got a gargantuan task. I mean, I've covered Vanderbilt for 20 years now. What he inherited, and I've seen a lot of bad football, was the worst situation I've ever seen. I mean, I, I could I could take the whole next hour telling you what was wrong and what he's got to rebuild. It's going to be a while before they're competitive. Yeah, I think at least the end of next year. But I think he's trying to reestablish a better culture. The discipline is much better. They're getting more speed, which they desperately needed. The, the next task will be to compet be competitive in the trenches, which they're a long way from doing it. I think you know last year was was awful. You had the opening day loss to ETSU, which is bad as Vanderbilt's been. It has not been losing to FCS teams. You had the Georgia game where they were down what thirty five nothing at the end of the first quarter. When it was bad, it was really bad a year ago, but. They were competitive. They had a chance to beat South Carolina, blew a lead in the final minute on the road, had a chance to beat Missouri with four or five minutes to play, couldn't close. I think he's made the program better, but the bottom was so far down that even doing a good job, they've just got a long way to go. I think this would be a year where they get better, but I don't know that you'll see an improvement in wins and losses given the schedule they've got. Is the administration willing to be patient? Because, as you mentioned, it may be until the end of next season before we really see that progress. Yeah, it, it is. I think that the new president came in, and from what I was told, was horrified at the wreck that the program had become. I think horrified with the wreck that their administration had been. They have committed about three to four hundred million dollars to facilities improvements. I don't know how public that is. Uh, they buried that on a Friday news dump because they're scared of their own administration, which is not in favor of sports. I think they want to do that, but kind of keep it on the down low, uh, maybe advertise it in recruiting. Yeah, I think he's going to get a long time. He was the chancellor's handpicked guy. 
He's an alum. His dad's an alum. He's very well liked and respected. I, I think Clark Year is going to get. Excuse me, Clark Lee. I think will get a minimum of five years to get this turned around. So I know outside of Vandy, there have been talks like, I wonder if all this conference expansion stuff happens if, if Vandy gets kicked out or they decide to leave. None of that is possible. This is more social media conversations. But has there been any whispers there internally, like maybe things would be better if we weren't in the toughest conference in the world? Well, yeah. I mean, you can't help but think that, right? I mean, just when they get the facilities right, just when they get some concessions and some other things, the world blows up. You've got NIL. You've got the portal. You've got Texas and Oklahoma. I've, I've asked around for a few years, would the SEC kick them out? The answer I've always gotten is no. I, I think you've got conference presidents like that as a destination. They, they come to Nashville. They bring their top alum. They make some of their big asks there. It's a great road trip for fans. It's been an easy win. So I don't think there's any danger of the league kicking them out. I don't think that's been present. I know that's been speculated, but I can't find anything that makes it solid. And I think the thing to watch is ESPN and the networks are controlling a lot of what goes on with expansion. Would there be a day where you get to, you know, a couple of super conferences where ESPN said, hey, they're not worth our time? I, I think that's the more likely scenario, but, but how that plays out and the optics of kicking out a, a charter member of the league, that, that, that might be tough, but – it's a new world we're in. You know, we always that, use the first day of school kind of conversation or talking point, but what does it mean that day you report and what typically happens on report day? Um, it's a big day, you know, especially for the freshmen, right? These guys have worked their entire lives to get to this point and, and earning the opportunity to play football in a program in a school like this is obviously a game changer. Uh, but it, it's interesting, man. There's definitely a lot of mixed emotions. You're excited, you're nervous, you're fired up. Uh, but there's so many things that go th that take place that, that people probably don't think of, right? You you do your way in, you know, you kind of do your physical, uh, you go to your locker room, you get your equipment, you know, compliance comes in and talks to you about all the updated rules and regulations. I'm sure the compliance meetings now are insane right. with the NIL stuff. Um, you know, you have your academic advisors typically come in and start talking about the semester ahead. And you got all kinds of different stuff, but it's just a it's a lot of stuff that happens that first day. You're getting the stuff for install, starting to install the playbook, yeah. you're getting all that. But it's changed so much from when I was here where these guys are working together during the summers more often. I was gonna say that's gotta change it, right? Because like it doesn't feel like a first day if you worked all summer here and you were and you were an early early enrollee and then you came in, in June, let's say, like it's just another of the that's first right. days, it's right? An, it's another step in the process of trying to get to the goal, which is to win an SEC championship. So it has changed because they, I think it was 2003, after my redshirt freshman year, that they changed it to where scholarship athletes could be here during the summer mm -hmm. and or report early. Like There was no early enrollee stuff happening yet, but my freshman year, coming into my true freshman year, 02, I was living on the couch with Jackson Appel you know, and some other guys because they couldn't pay for us yet, but they still encourage you to get up here. If you can't, So right. you weren't getting any money yet. I was sleeping on couches eating, you know, Mickey D's and double cheeseburgers, you know, and just trying to make it until we reported. And now it's completely changed. These guys are enrolled. You know, they're taking classes. They're coming early in the spring semester. And so, yeah, it's probably not the same as it used to be. But overall, as a player, reporting day, man, it's, it's what you're here for, man. Yeah. It's, it's the, the start of a new season and a new journey for a new team. The, those first couple of practices, too, that first hit, that second hit, like you're trying to make – you want coaches to notice who you are right yeah. away, right? You, it, 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 there's some, probably a little bit more pressure early than – when you've been in camp for two weeks. You know what's funny is I, I think that the way that Jimbo and this staff are recruiting, that the pressure is now on the veterans because of the amount yeah. of talent that they're bringing in with these freshman classes. Like the pressure is on these veterans, these guys that have been here for a few years that are role players. It's like you just know without a shadow of a doubt, I got three five-star kids behind me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I've, I've contributed on special teams and played a little bit. If I don't get my mind right and really dial it in and focus as a player – like I'm screwed. Like it's just it's just the nature of the beast. And Jimbo and this staff have recruited at such a high level that, you know, reporting day probably has a lot more nerves than it used to because yeah. you're looking at these freshman class coming. And you're like, that don't Holy look like a freshman. Crap! Like, right? Who is this guy? You know. And so, uh, yeah, it's interesting, man. It's going to be fun to see how it goes for these guys. That's the scary part and the cool part, but also like now that anybody can leave, like I hope, and I know Jimbo does a good job, but like. You, you've got to stress to them, you've got to go through adversity if yeah. you want to be great. No, that's exactly right, man. Like anything that you want 
I think in life, whether it's as a football player, as a track runner, as a basketball player, as a professional, anything that you want is on the other side of your comfort zone. So these kids now that can leave and go wherever they want, I think there's some benefit to that because sometimes there's valid reasons to transfer. You know, mm -hmm. I, I believe that. Um, but I think that it's going to be the Wild West, especially these kids now that from the time they're in seventh, eighth grade, they're being told they're the best. They're the best. They got social media profiles everywhere. They come here and compete and they don't win that job. Well, they got mom, dad, cousins, aunts, grannies, whoever in the background. Man, you're the best, bro. You know what I'm saying? You got to get out there and go get yours. Go eat. No, get yours here. Right. Like, learn what it takes to grind where you're at. You know, learn the system. Actually realize that there's people that are as talented or more talented than you that are older than you that have been here. It takes time. And so I think they just open up the door for people to just quit when they face adversity. And, and that changed the job for the coaches. The coaches now have to recruit them to get here, recruit Couldn't them hear. to stay, yeah. and then almost become like a mentor life coach. Like, hey, man, like, I know this isn't going the way that you thought it was going. But you can't quit. Don't don't leave. You know, stay here. Put the time in. You're an injury or two away from playing. Learn the system. You're 18 years old. So the whole coach's jobs are 10 times harder than it used to be even 10 years ago. Yeah. That, they have to do so many things now as a coach. The Jordan Addison situation from Pitt to USC is the one that really bugs me because if you're a guy who's like you're entering your senior year, let's say, or maybe your junior year, and look, I'm just not going to start here. There's this five-star kid who's here. I'd rather you stay because we need your depth and we don't know how it's going to play out. But I kind of get that. But it's when you've been the star player at your position, you helped your team get to some new heights, and now you're like, well, i got a little bit more money waiting for me across the, across the country. I'm going to go there. That's where I have a problem with it. I know, man. It's tough. There's so many talking points and arguments on this. But, like, you, the team fed you. Like, you were the best receiver in the country. You know, it's like you were a machine there. Like, why not stay and continue yeah. with the people that, you know, got you to where you were but again like you said with money out there now you know who knows the kid's family situation I mean you just never know I don't know but I do know it's frustrating to see you know a guy win an award or be that good and leave and go to a lateral move you know yeah. to another program it just it's frustrating to see were you one of those that was nervous during the recruiting period this year where the numbers weren't coming in and you know the the Twitter mob was like I oh, A&M they, they figured them out they're not gonna be able to recruit like they did and here we are you know right after the pool party Bam, commit, bam, commit, bam, commit. Like, it's just back to normal. No, I'm, I, truly, I say this, like, I'm absolutely not nervous at all. You know, were they lagging a little bit? Yeah, but, man, they experienced a lot of turnover from a recruiting staff standpoint, which is a big deal. It is. Uh, but ultimately, this guy, the head coach of this football team, has proven for his entire career that he knows how to recruit. Yeah. And he's done it every single Every time we do the signing day show, or the early signing day show, we're, like, blown away at what's happening, how he closes, how they finish as a staff. And so I'm not worried about it. And ultimately, when you, got, when you get guys here to campus, especially that pool party thing they do, Coach Price's barbecue, and then when you get them here to the football games, that's when A&M really kind of starts to take off. So you just block out all the chatter. Quit worrying about it. Look at the results of what this guy has done his yeah. entire career and realize, man, there's nothing to worry about. All right, everybody, you know what to do. What do they do after they watch the video? They need to go get on YouTube. Well, that's where they're watching us right now. They're oh. currently watching us on YouTube. <laughs> they need to share it. They need to like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the things. Go watch it. Share it with your friends and like it. And comment. Comment, yes. If you can comment, say talk about what they say, my rooster tail on the back. Yeah, I, I didn't know what that meant. But, <laughs> I didn't either. I but, didn't either. But now we know. It's TechSex Rewind. We'll see you tomorrow.